Shalom. Today we are going to talk about this little piece of Psalm 19, and in particular, the mm -hmm. word line. As we read from the opening of the psalm, the heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth his handiwork. Day unto day uttereth speech, and night unto night showeth knowledge. There is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. Their line is gone out through all the earth, their words to the end of the world. In them hath he set a tabernacle for the sun. It's very clear from the context here that the word line has something to do with speech or language. The reason that the pronouns are plural, uh, their voice, their line, is because the heavens are plural. We don't, uh, we would probably say it's, but in keeping with the Hebrew grammar, it says there. So what exactly is this line? The Hebrew word is kav, kufav, and it usually means a kind of a cord or a measuring line. First Kings 7.23 And he made a molten sea, ten cubits, from the one brim to the other, it was round all about, and his height was five cubits, and a line of thirty cubits did compass it about. So we see that uh, they're measuring the uh, molten sea which Solomon made. We're going to get back to that in a minute. Ezekiel 47.3 And when the man that had the line in his hand went forth eastward, he measured a thousand cubits, and he brought me through the waters. The waters were to the ankles. So clearly this line is a measuring line. It's a cord used for measuring. Well, what has a line got to do with words? Well, we use it even uh, when an actor is on stage. We say, well, he is reciting his lines. And we can see lines on the page, typewritten lines. The speeches look like lines on a page. We can use it maybe even colloquially. Oh, don't give me that line. Don't say those words because they're not adding up to uh, what you're trying to express here. You're trying to flamboozle somebody by giving them a line. So the idea of a, a cord or a measuring line has something to do with the idea of speech. And it's used again in that uh, form here from Isaiah 28.10. It's the same word for precept must be upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little and there a little. So this is a, it says tzav tzav, that means precept upon precept, commandment upon commandment, and kav kav, line upon line. We assume that this is some kind of speech, God speaking something like a commandment or a precept, and this is how he builds our understanding. There's another uh, word which draws together the idea of a line and vocalization. And that word is zemer. In Judges 5.3 we read, Hear, O ye kings, and give ear, O ye princes. I, even I, will sing unto Yahweh. I will sing praise to Yahweh, the God of Israel. So this is zemer. This is a verb to sing, to sing a song. In Psalm 48, 1, a song and psalm. You know that the word for psalm is mizmor. It comes from the same root for the sons of Korah. Great is Yahweh and greatly to be praised in the city of our God, in the mountain of his holiness. So this root, zemer, zamar, has to do with singing, is more a song. But it also means to prune. Leviticus 25, 3. Six years thou shalt sow thy field, and six years thou shalt prune thy vineyard, and gather in the fruit thereof. And verse 4, but in the seventh year shall be a Sabbath of rest unto the land, a Sabbath for Yahweh. Thou shalt neither sow thy field nor prune thy vineyard. It's exactly the same verb, zamar. And uh, here we are, we're in a Shemitah year, where we are um, letting the land to rest by not pruning. So how is pruning 
related to singing. It comes from the idea of plucking. So if you have a string and you make that action as if you were plucking a fruit, that string will vibrate and it will make a song. In fact, in our throat, we have something called vocal cords. They're a line, they're a cord, they're not for measuring, although perhaps we should use them to measure our speech better day by day. The verb root for kav is kava, and it is uh, often translated as to wait. Genesis 49, 18, I have waited for thy salvation, Yahweh. Psalm 25, 5, lead me in thy truth and teach me, for thou art the God of my salvation. On thee do I wait all the day. Now we might wonder, what a measuring cord has to do with waiting. But I think we can understand that when we're waiting, we're kind of reeling out the cord, measuring the time. How long will this take? And we have an expectation. So the idea of waiting has to do with the idea of measuring as the time goes by. The first use of kava is in Genesis 1.9. And God said, let the waters under the heaven be gathered together unto one place and let the dry land appear. And it was so. Here, this root means to be gathered together. Jeremiah 3.17 At that time they shall call Jerusalem the throne of Yahweh and all the nations will be gathered unto it. To the name of Yahweh, to Jerusalem, neither shall they walk any more after the imagination of their evil heart. So we have this idea of being gathered together uh, in, in the physical sense of the waters being gathered to one place and then as prophecy uh, in a time perhaps to come that the people will be gathered into one place. And you probably know that this gathering of water where the waters run together free-flowing is called a mikvah, and that is the place of the ritual bath. Genesis 1.10, And God called the dry land earth, and the gathering together of the waters he called seas, and God saw it was good. It was the mikvah. Leviticus 11.36, Nevertheless, a fountain or pit, wherein there is plenty of water, shall be clean, but that which touches their carcass shall be unclean, talking about if, you know, a dead skunk falls in your well or something. So um, the plenty of water is the mikvah. There's lots of running water there. And I just want to take a minute to uh, dispel an idea while I was trying to gather scriptures for this uh, presentation. I thought about the gathering of the people. And I, I remembered this verse from Genesis 49.10, The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet, until Shiloh come, and unto him shall be the gathering of the people. And uh, I didn't know there are other words for gathering, like uh, kabats, like kibbutz is a word for gathering. But uh, that word did not appear, and neither did this word uh, kava appear. It was a totally different word. And in looking at all the other translations, we see that, as in the New King James, it says that to him shall the, be the obedience of the people. So uh, that's a better translation of that word, although the two roots are uh, confused elsewhere between Kings and Chronicles. But this is a better translation that, that he will, um, the people will come, and the obedience of the people will be to him. Uh, quite a different picture there. I guess you can maybe understand why the King James people made that translation of gathering. Now, as it happens, mikveh has another translation, which appears here and also in the parallel verse in Chronicles. First Kings 10.28, And Solomon had horses brought out of Egypt and linen yarn. The king's merchants received the linen yarn at a price. So now we are back to the cord. But wait, there's another translation from mikveh 
and that is hope. Jeremiah 14, 8. O oh, the hope of Israel, the Savior thereof, in time of trouble, why shouldst thou be as a stranger in the land, and as a wayfaring man that turneth aside to tarry for a night? And in Jeremiah 17:13, O oh, Yahweh, the hope of Israel, all that forsake thee shall be ashamed, and they that depart from me shall be written in the earth, because they have forsaken Yahweh, the fountain of living waters. Uh, this has its own interesting side note here. Uh, we think of Yeshua bending down and writing the names of the uh, accusers of the woman caught in adultery in the earth. Uh, maybe they have forsaken Yahweh. But we see mikvah now is hope. So we can uh, easily tie the idea of hope to the idea of waiting. If you're waiting for something, you hope it's going to happen. But you say, I, I know the word for hope. The word for hope in Hebrew is Hatikva, and that is the national anthem of Israel, Hatikva. And you are absolutely right. We see this word Tikva used in Tanakh. Ruth 1.12 Turn again, my daughters, go your way, for I am too old to have a husband. If I should say, I have hope, if I should have a husband also tonight and should also bear sons, well, she doesn't have that hope. And so she is encouraging the, the daughters-in-law to go home and remarry from amongst their own people. Job 14.7 For there is hope of a tree, if it be cut down, that it will sprout again, and that the tender branch thereof will not cease. If we wait with a measure of time, we have hope that we will see this the tree sprout up a new branch. Proverbs 11.23 The desire of the righteous is only good, but the expectation of the wicked is wrath. I would not say that the wicked man is hoping to receive wrath, but he can expect it in a measure of time. And tikva also means, again, the cord, the measuring line. Joshua 2.21, And she said, According unto your word, so be it. And she sent them away, and they departed, and she bound the scarlet line in the window. So uh, we have come, if you'll pardon the pun, full circle. We started with the string, the string as a measuring tool. And if we measure our time as we're waiting, it will come around to our hope. But the string we see in the beginning is to measure the, the laver, the mikvah, which is the gathering of the waters and the people. Now, it has been said, if you want, if you were going to do a, um, a search for extraterrestrial intelligence or some other unknown intelligent life form, that the way you could uh, be sure that they could understand something about you when you send your message would be to embed a mathematical construct within your message. I'm going back to the first verse that we read about the laver and uh, how Solomon made it and the size of it. And you can see that the verse in uh, 1 Kings 7.23 is exactly the same as the parallel verse in 2 Chronicles 4.2, except for one hay. And this is the hay on the word kav, which is here, the, the measuring line telling us how big the labor is by its diameter, its depth, and its circumference. We'll look at the English in a moment. But... When you see that extra hay, and you see it has no vowels, when there are scribal anomalies in the text, this is called kativ kri. So the kativ is from katav to write. And they put that, the kativ, what's written in the line of text. And then you're going to have a footnote or a note to the side. Sometimes they put the correction in line, but somewhere uh, on your page is going to show you the correction. The correction is the Cre from Kara to read. And if you look 
in a Bible, a printed Bible, you will see a notation in 1 Kings that you don't read Kava, that you read Kav the same way that it is printed in 2 Chronicles, as you see below. So the translation of this is, also he made a molten sea of 10 cubits from brim to brim, round and compass, and five cubits, the height thereof, and a line of 30 cubits that compass it round about. Now, unfortunately, this is just bad math. The circumference is uh, 30, and the diameter is 10. If we wanted, if we had the measure for the diameter, and we wanted to know the circumference, we should multiply it by the constant pi, which you see below as 3.14159. The diameter is 10. So the actual circumference should be 31.4159, but the Bible says that it's 30. So obviously, there are, uh, God is a bad mathematician, or they're primitive people, so they just round it off. There are many explanations, and people who like to show the faults of the Bible will tell you that this is a, a big bad mistake that's in the Bible. However, if you take the numerical value for the scribal an anomaly, which is kuf vav he, on the top, on the left, that adds up to 111. The kuf is 100, the vav is 6, the he is 5. And you divide that by the proper spelling, which is the kuf vav, that which adds up to 106. And you take that fraction and times it by the original 30 that's stated in the Bible, voila, you get 31.41509 pretty close, pretty accurate. Now I did not discover that about the uh, fraction converting the uh, written circumference to the mathematical circumference, but I did discover this. The volume of a sphere, and I did not remember it, I had to look it up, the formula is 4 thirds pi r cubed. In this case we've seen that the radius is 5. The uh, diameter is listed as 10. <coughs> Half of that is 5. The height of the thing is listed as 10, as 5. So we have a, a spherical shape. So I figured the volume, that didn't look very interesting, but actually we only have half a sphere, so I divided that by 2, and it came up with uh, 261.8, and I accidentally discovered that the square root of that is 16.18. And the reason that this is interesting is that this is the digits for, uh, some people say phi in English, it's actually phi in Greek. This is the value of the golden ratio, 1.618. And the golden ratio, uh, if you don't know anything about it, has a lot to do with natural growth, for example, when we look at the little nautilus shell, how the increase in size of each next little cubicle compares to the previous one. Um, and is also related to the uh, relative uh, parts of, of a whole thing, some buildings or even the human being, how it's created and what is considered to be very beautiful is based on this ratio. So I guess it's no surprise that it, suddenly appears, but it's another mathematical constant, constant which is built in to the biblical text. So where are we? We have a string, we have a measuring line, we're measuring time, we're waiting, and we're hoping, and our waiting and our hoping is uh, in the picture of the labor has to do with the gathering of the waters and the gathering of the people. Galatians 4.4 4. But when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his Son, made of a woman, made under the law, under the Torah. Ephesians 1.12 That in the dispensation of the fullness of times, he might gather together in one all things in Messiah, 
both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him. Romans 8.22 For we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. Romans 11.25 For I would not, brethren, that ye be ignorant of this mystery, lest ye be wise in your own conceits, that blindness in part is happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. 2 Thessalonians 2.1 Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Yeshua the Messiah, and by our gathering together unto him. And in Isaiah 2.2 And it shall come to pass in the last days that the mountain of Yahweh's house shall be established in the top of the mountains, and it shall be exalted above the hills, and all nations shall flow unto it. As you are hoping, waiting, measuring time, Tasimata Inayim Al Hashemayim, keep your eyes on the sky, your redemption draweth nigh. Shalom.